Good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to be here with you. You know, this is Zoo Lovers Day today, and although you can't come to the zoo, I thought we might in some small way bring the zoo to you and read one of the most famous zoo books, at least when I was growing up as a kid. Maybe you've been able to share it uh, as well uh, with your parents. It's also 120, our 125th anniversary here at the zoo, so we've been uh, a prominent part of Omaha uh, for a long, long, long time, uh, ever since 1895. And here we are in 2020, 125 years later. And it's tough to celebrate right now, but we will be celebrating later on in the summer and in the fall, uh, especially memories all of you have had about coming to the zoo with your grandparents or parents or uh, even more currently uh, with your current family. So I want to read a book that I got to know as a kid, and it's this book right here, If I Ran the Zoo. And it's kind of fun for me because here I am running a zoo, and um, I think it's a nice story. Um, it's very different from what we do now, but it really uh, enables you to be really super creative about what you, about what you want to do. So this is the Dr. Seuss book, If I Ran the Zoo. And I bought this quite a long time ago, but it is the original version in, from 1950. So this is a 70-year-old book that I have here. So this came out in several editions. Uh, they reprinted it over and over and over again because it was so popular. So this was the first one out. So, If I Ran the Zoo by Dr. Seuss. And it's a story about uh, a more typical zoo and also more importantly a story about a little boy who thinks he can direct be the director of an even better zoo by being really creative about the animals that live there and so his imagination runs wild uh, about the type of animals he'd have in the zoo and this is what that's about and in typical Dr. Seuss fashion there are a lot of rhymes in here so some of the words are a little tough and I had to read through it just to make sure I got the pronunciation right so here we go. It's a pretty good zoo, said young Gerald McGrew, and the fellow who runs it seems proud of it too. That's me, and I am very proud of it. But if I ran the zoo, said young Gerald McGrew, I'd make a few changes. That's just what I'd do. The lions and tigers and that kind of stuff they have up here now are not quite good enough. You see things like these in any old zoo. They're awfully old fashioned. I want something new. So I'd open each cage, I'd unlock every pen, I'd let the animals go, and I'd start all over again. And somehow or other, I'd think I could find some beasts of a much more unusual kind. A four-footed lion's not much of a beast. The one in my zoo will have ten feet at least. Five legs on the left, five more on the right. The, then people will stare and they'll say, what a sight. This zookeeper, new keeper, Gerald's quite keen. That's the gall darnest lion I have ever seen. And here's the lion with five feet on the left and five feet on the right that you can see. So he's already given you a clue that he's got quite an imagination. My new zoo, McGrew Zoo, and he named it after himself too, will make people talk. My new zoo, McGrew Zoo, will make people gawk at the strangest odd creatures that ever did walk. I'll get for my zoo a new sort of a hen who roosts in another hen's top knot and then another one roosts in the top knot of his and another in his and another in his and so forth and upward and onward gee whiz and the top knot is a cluster of feathers on the top of a head usually you see it in a in a duck or something and so here it is each of them sitting on the other one's head But that's just a start. I'll do better than that. They'll come see me next day in my zookeeper's hat, coming into my zoo with an elephant cat. They'll be so surprised, they'll all swallow their gum. They'll ask when they see my strange animals come, where do you suppose he gets things like that from? His animals all have such very odd faces. I bet he must hunt them in rather odd places. And that's what I'll do, said young Gerald McGrew. If you want to catch beasts you don't see every day, you'll have to go to places quite out of the way. You'll have to go to places no others can get to. You'll have to get cold and you'll have to get wet too. Up past the North Pole where the frozen winds squeal, uh, go up and hunt in my Skeagol mobile. 
and bring back a family of what do you know? And that's how my new zoo, McGrew Zoo, will go. So here he is in his Skigomobile up in the Arctic where it's really cold to bring him back. I'll hunt in the mountains of Zamba Matant with helpers who all wear their eyes at a slant and capture a fine fluffy bird called the Bustard who eats only custard with soft sauce made of mustard and also a very fine beast called the Flustered who only eats mustard with sauce made of custard. And what he didn't know is there really is a bird called a Bustard and it lives in Africa. Thought I'd mention that. I'll catch them in caves and I'll catch them in brooks, I'll catch them in crannies, I'll catch them in nooks that you don't read about in geography books. I'll catch them in countries that no one can spell, like the country of Matafapata Fapel. In a country like that, if a hunter is clever, he'll hunt up some beasts that you never saw ever. I'll load up five boats with a family of jotes whose feet are like cows and wear squirrel skin coats and sit down like dogs but have voices like goats, excepting they can't sing the very high notes. And I'll go down to the wilds of Nantucket and capture a family of lunks in a bucket. And people will say, no, I like that boy heaps. His new group zoo, McGrew Zoo, is growing by leaps. He captures them wild and he brings them back meek. He captures them slim and he captures them sleek. What do you suppose he will capture next week? I'll capture one tiny, I'll capture one cute. I'll capture a deer that no hunter would shoot. A deer that's so nice he could sleep in your bed if it weren't for those horns he has on his head. Take a look at those horns. That would be a tough to sleep with there without getting jabbed. And speaking of horns that are just a bit queer, I'll bring back an odd family of deer father, a mother, two sisters, a brother, whose horns are connected from one to the other, whose horns are so mixed you can't tell them apart, can't tell where they'll end, and can't tell where they'll start. Each deer's mighty puzzled. He's never yet found if his horns are hers or the other way around. Look at that snaggle of horns. I'll capture them fat and I'll capture them scrawny. I'll capture a scraggle foot mulligatawny, a high stepping animal fast as the wind from the blistering sands of the desert of Zind. The beast is the beast that the brave chieftains ride when they want to go fast to find some place to hide. A mulligatawny is fine for my zoo and so is a chieftain. I'll bring one back too. Here's this, look at this wild guy right here. Quite an imagination from Gerald McGrew. In the far western part of southeast North Dakota, there's a very fine animal called the iota. Uh, but I'll capture one who is even much finer in the northeastern west part of South Carolina. When people see him, they will say, now by thunder, this new McGrew, new zoo, McGrew zoo is really a wonder. Most beasts are quite friendly, but still, in some lands, some beasts are too dangerous to catch with bare hands. But those that are ugly and vicious and mean uh, build a bad animal catching machine. It's rather expensive to build such a kit, but with it, a hunter can never get bit. So here's his, looks like a little bird cage that he can lower down over. Look at the tusks he put on this creature here. A zoo should have bugs, so I'll capture a thwirl whose legs are snarled up in a terrible snarl. Then I'll go out and I'll capture, capture some chugs, some keen shooter, mean shooter, bean shooter bugs. And I'll go to African island of Yurka and bring back a tizzle topped tufted mazurka, kind of canary with quite a tall throat. His neck is so long if he swallows an oat for breakfast the first day of April, they say it has to go down such a long way that it gets to his stomach the 15th of May. Here it is, look at that neck. That's why it takes so long for the food to come down to reach his throat.
A bag of big bug who's very surprising, a feller who has a propeller for rising and zooming around making cross-country hops from Texas to Boston with only two stops. Now that sort of thing for a bug is just tops. And when I've caught him, the next thing you know, I'll go and I'll capture a wild tic-tac-toe. With X's that win and zeros that lose, he'll look mighty good in this zoo of McGrews. And you can see there's the animal with the tic-tac-toe on his stomach. I'll bring back a gusset, a gherkin, a gasket, and also a gooch from the wilds of Nantasket. And eight Persian princes will carry the basket. So what their names are, I don't know, so don't ask it. A cave, in a cave in Khartoum lives a beach, beast called the Natch that no other hunter's been able to catch. He's hidden for years in his cave with a pout, and no one has been able to make him come out. But I'll coax him out with a wonderful meal that's cooked by my cooks in a cooker mobile. They'll fix up a dish that's just to his taste, three chicken croquettes made of library paste, then sprinkled with peanut shucks, pickled and spiced, then baked at 600 degrees, and then iced. It's mighty hard cooking to cook up such feasts, but that's how the new zoo Magruzu gets beasts. Look at this, it looks like a camper here with a cooking stove on it. And there's the shy little creature who he's trying to entice out. Now go to the faraway mountains of Tobsk, near the river of Nobsk, and bring back an Obsk, the sort of thing the sort of a kind of a thingamabobsk who only eats rhubarb and corn on the coast. And people will flock to my zoo in a mopsk. McGrew, they will say, does a wonderful jobsk. He hunts with such vim and he hunts with such vigor. His new zoo, McGrew Zoo, gets bigger and bigger. And speaking of birds, there's the Russian Paluski. Whose, red, whose head ski is red ski and belly is blue ski. I get one of them for my Zuski Magruski. Here he is, very colorful bird. Red hat. Now the whole town will gasp. Why this boy never sleeps. No keeper before is ever kept what he keeps. There's no telling what that young fellow will do. And then just to show them, I'll sail to Katru and bring back an Itkutch, a Preep, and a Prue, a Nurkle, a Nerd, and a Seersucker, too. A hunt in the jump jungles of Hippo no Hungus and bring back a flock of wild Bippo no Bungus. The Bippo no Bungus from Hippo no Hungus are better than those down in Dippo no Dungus, smarter than those out in Nippo no Nungus. And that's why I'll catch, up and catch them in Hippo no Hungus, instead of those others in Nungus and Dungus. And people will say when they see these bips bounding, this zookeeper, new keepers, simply astounding. He travels so far and you think he would drop. When do you suppose this young fellow will stop? Stop? Well, I should. But, but I won't stop until I've captured the Vizamawizamadil, the world's biggest bird from the island of Gwark, who only eats pine trees and spits out the bark. And boy, when I get him back home to my park, the whole world will say, young McGrew, he's made his mark. He built a zoo better than Noah's whole ark. These wonderful, marvelous beasts that he chooses have made him the greatest of all the McGrewses. So here it is, the Vizamawizamadil, pretty big one. Wow, they all cheer, what this zoo must be worth. It's the Gull Darna Zoo on the face of the earth. And here it is with all those animals in McGrew's Zoo. Yes, that's what I do, said young Gerald McGrew. I'd make a few changes if I ran the zoo. So this was a book that I read as a kid and it kind of inspired me and it brought out some of the creativity in me 
uh, and of course we do things very differently. The way McGrew looked at his zoo, the animals had to be very different and they had to be kind of handmade and put together and found. As a kid, I found lions and tigers and bustards and hummingbirds and meerkats just as fascinating as McGrew found in this wonderful compilation of animals he put in this book, and I hope you do too. So when I was growing up, books like this and other books about animals were really, really interesting to me and they really helped stoke my interest in animals. And as a kid, I had hamsters that had babies. My dad grew up in a farm and so he always liked chickens. And so in our garage, we had a chicken that when he got home from work, he would let out and it would follow him to the backyard where he would just chill out in the backyard he brought some uh, seed with it and the chick, he would just find great enjoyment and peace and quiet in feeding his chicken. I also had a rabbit and of course we had a dog and a parakeet, all the typical kinds of things. And I was always fascinated by how these animals just lived and how the different they were from you and I. And I really wanted to learn more and more and more about their life histories, their natural history and how they survived. So that's what really kind of got me going. And I studied uh, more biology in high school and in college, certainly I did. And frankly, I never thought I could be a zoo director. In fact, I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me that I could be a zoo director because I was so intent on just wanting to work with animals. Um, and I got my first job in Chicago and worked at the zoo there and I absolutely loved it. But it didn't take long for me to realize that I was stoking, I was feeding my own interest here and wanting to work and be around animals and learn all I could about them. And the part that changed for me was when I began to realize that I had a much greater responsibility at the zoo to not just feed my own interest in animals, but to cultivate others' interests in animals so that wildlife would always be a part of our world. And so I switched gears a little bit. Sure, I still enjoyed working with the animals, but I began to really enjoy talking to people about animals and having a bigger and bigger impact. And the more I enjoyed that and the more I realized what the mission of the zoo was, uh, the more I wanted to do more and more. And lo and behold, here I am um, at a fantastic zoo, working very hard to make it better every day. Um, and I can't wait for you to come back and see the new things that we've been cooking up since you've been gone. And so, um, Hopefully it'll just be a few more months and you'll be back here maybe sooner. We'll see how it goes, but I want to invite you to come back to the zoo and get reacquainted uh, with wildlife and make sure that wildlife are always a part of your life as it has been mine. Thank you.